Uh, well, hello and a very warm welcome to this webinar, Asset Quality Review of European Banks, brought to you by Scope Ratings. Uh, my name is Keith Mullin and it's my pleasure to be your moderator for today. And I'm delighted to be joined by Nicola Ardi, Scope's Deputy Head of Financial Institutions. Good afternoon, Keith. Good afternoon, everyone. Now, as we will have seen, a higher rates have benefited European bank profitability owing to widen their interest margins. But at the same time, the economic and geopolitical backdrop, as well as the general business environment, have been and continue to be challenging. So how has asset quality held up through 2023 and how are the banks positioned to withstand any deterioration? In a moment, Nicola will take you through a presentation designed to answer those questions. Now, after the presentation, we'll be happy to take your questions. So please do type these into the questions tab as we go along. And one more thing before I hand over to Nicola, Scope will be publishing a research note on this topic around mid-November. So we'll let you know when that's out. So that's it from me, uh, Nicola. Great to see you as always. Let me hand over to you. Thanks a lot, Keith. So today we, we discuss the, the big picture, uh, how asset quality uh, metrics are evolving for European banks. And we've opted for this title, uh, European banks at a crossroads, and we'll elaborate on this uh, title. So where are we uh, at the moment? I think it's nice to uh, step back a bit and look at the long-term trend because across Europe, uh, since the last uh, financial crisis, we have had a very interesting development in terms of uh, asset quality for European banks. Basically, we've had a huge cleaning of balance sheets. And you can see that on the left uh, hand side of the, the slide, uh, this evolution from 2018, uh, 2015, sorry, uh, and to date, uh, um, uh, by 2015, we were at sort of the, the peak of the stock of uh, non-performing loan uh, in uh, Europe, uh, close to a trillion at that time. And it took about seven to eight years to reach that peak. So it's very important also to keep that in mind when we, we discuss challenging operating condition and NPL formation. There is always a time lag and the peak was reached around 2015. So we were there and uh, in a couple of years, seven, eight years, we've reached about 40% of this uh, total amount uh, in 2015, a trillion. In June 2023, we were at about 400 billion. So that was a very active balance sheet cleaning. A um, lot of efforts put, put into that efforts also to create the infrastructure to clean uh, banks' balance sheet uh, across Europe. Now, if we zoom in uh, and we base a bit this uh, evolution, we start at the end of 2019, that's the chart in the middle. And this was just before the start of the pandemic. And we were all expecting um, asset quality to deteriorate very rapidly, given the, the macroeconomic uh, shock at that time early 2020. And it did not happen uh, at all. Uh, you can see the trend. Uh, balance sheet continues to improve over time during that period. And that was a very positive development. So what we were fearing a bit uh, because of the support measure was that we could see a sort of lag effect and a catch up effect in terms of NPL formation. And then came this uh, change in monetary policy with the decisions to um, increase uh, interest rates. So we, we are now in this uh, last rebasement. We look at uh, early 2022 when the ECB started to uh, revise interest rate uh, upward. And uh, uh, since then, uh, so about 12 to 18 months since this uh, move started, uh, we don't see yet asset quality deteriorating, but we are at really an inflection point. So this is why we believe European banks are at a crossroads, is that for the first time, based on the June 2023 uh, EBA dashboard, we can see that the stock of NPLs is growing again. And this is a very 
new trend compared to uh, what we have seen uh, over the years in the past. Here we are looking at the stock of NPL. Of course, it's important to compare that also uh, relative to uh, the size of uh, loan books also. And so at the moment, we, uh, as of June, we were at 1.8% NPL ratio, weighted average uh, across Europe. And also just to, to compare, uh, by mid-2015, we were at around 6%. So it was divided by more than three over time. 1.8% NPL ratio as of June 2023. So it's a, it's a very solid starting point as we enter more challenging operating conditions. And uh, this is what we are going to look at uh, in the coming uh, slides also. So first headline metrics, non-performing loans. Um, if we dig a bit into the details of this evolution over time, we know that a few countries that were weaker uh, in terms of asset quality metrics than others have made huge efforts and have largely contributed to the current uh, situation. So we can think, uh, you can see that on the right, uh, and, and on the right, we only focus on the, the very recent years, but you have the long-term view on, on the left. Greece, Portugal, Ireland, Spain also at the beginning of this uh, period, they made a huge contribution cleaning their balance sheet uh, so that we are now at this uh, very low level. So it confirms also this convergence that it's not only uh, countries that were not heavily impacted by asset quality um, uh, deterioration that made progress, it was really a convergence. And this is really a theme across this presentation that the, the very solid starting point at the moment, uh, I think it's, it's a very positive development for banks to see that across Europe, we are observing this convergence uh, um, between markets. When we look at uh, individual banks, also where we are, uh, and here we are looking at the, the largest European banks, and we've added some uh, UK banks also. What, what we see is that since 2021, there is again this convergence in terms of NPL uh, ratios across the board. Uh, convergence, you can look at the scale also, we are uh, from zero to five only, uh, meaning that in, in many countries, we've came lower this 5% threshold, which was a sort of threshold to, to measure uh, improvement of asset quality across the board. So that's, uh, again, another uh, testimony to this um, long-term evolution of uh, uh, NPL uh, improvement across Europe. Now we move to a, a second very important headline metric. So we have seen NPLs improving. Uh, in terms of impact on uh, PNL, the cost of risk, how it has evolved over time also. Uh, and here we'll, we'll focus more on uh, the, the pandemic era and uh, since then. If you remember uh, in 2020, uh, many banks have made uh, efforts to provision uh, in case of a, a surge of NPLs. And it was mainly made at the very beginning uh, via uh, stage two uh, loans and management overlays. So really the decision to allocate provision in case of uh, a deterioration of asset quality. Finally, uh, it did not happen. And the good thing is that we have a flat line on, on the left. And it means that many banks have kept the buffers they have made during that time uh, very challenging. They, they haven't reversed the provision or entirely the provision made uh, at, at that time. And what we've seen in recent quarters, and it's still the case, is that banks are moving the provisions that were allocated to the pandemic uh, situation to other more vulnerable sectors. And the reason why we have had this uh, situation also is that right after uh, COVID, we've had some geopolitical risk uh, in, in Europe and banks were cautious about the potential impact on uh, macroeconomic performance, also energy crisis or energy prices moving up. Uh, so banks decided to keep the, the buffers aside. 
this is a very positive sign to have those extra buffer that relates to performing loans at the moment in case in the future we observe a deterioration of asset quality. And we have seen also uh, the convergence of the cost of risk on the, the right. You can see this by country and it's the same evolution again uh, looking at banks. Uh, for the first half of this year, so now we look at the, the very recent past, uh, you can see that for many banks the performance in terms of cost of risk was better than even uh, 2022. And some banks had a reversal of provision during the first half of the year. What we observe at the moment is uh, that banks are expecting a cost of risk to be closer to the, the medium uh, term average at the moment. So there is an ongoing normalization, but after a very, very good um, uh, asset uh, quality uh, period. So again, a very solid uh, starting point looking at those uh, metrics at e individual banks. Now, if we move from the, the headline metrics we monitor uh, to uh, potential early warning signal uh, that asset quality could deteriorate if indeed we are at a crossroad. And the first important one, of course, is, here it's really big picture, of course. We are looking at real GDP uh, for the largest uh, European countries. And we look at the IMF uh, forecast that were published just a few weeks ago uh, as part of the, the World Economic Outlook uh, in October. What is very positive here is that, yes, indeed, we have a few countries that are uh, facing some difficult economic conditions in 2023 that are in recession. But looking at the prospect ahead, uh, and we are already in November 2023, so we are supposed to have good visibility on 2024, uh, we can see that the, the, the macroeconomic prospects are relatively sound. This is, again, look at the scale. Uh, the, it's uh, moving from... Uh, from zero to uh, a max of about 3%. So it's not really bright, but at least we do not see uh, as a baseline scenario, Europe entering into a recession. So that's the key message on that slide. If this baseline scenario you know, proved to be correct, there is not a massive NPL shock to be expected just because of macroeconomic performance. A second uh, interesting uh, potential early uh, warning signal relates to lending dynamics. At what speed um, credit is provided to the economy, how banks are managing underwriting criteria, and what is really the credit demand from borrowers. So we have again here this um, uh, starting point pre-COVID. We, we, we can see that during COVID in many countries, uh, supply, credit supply uh, worked well. And now we've reached this inflection point. It's not really a surprise because that's what we, we should expect in the context of rising interest rate. And this is a sort of natural transmission mechanism between rising rates and the attempt to slow down the economy to fight uh, inflation at the moment. So that's really... Um, an illustration of uh, how the, the monetary, the ECB monetary policy, and also uh, how this is done by other central bank, how it's um, gradually um, taking effect on, on the economy. What is very positive here is that what we observe at the moment, it's a slowdown of macroeconomic performance and a slowdown of um, loan production. And this is control and banks are managing also this trend by having tighter underwriting criteria. So it's not something that is out of control. It's a deliberate uh, movement at the moment. The key question of course is for how long and is it going to accelerate um, this slowdown in uh, credit uh, production? So those are uh, questions for the future. 
A third uh, interesting early warning signal for us is uh, relates to the, the stage two loans. So if you remember uh, under IFRS 9, this accounting um, rule, uh, loans, customer loans may be, and, and others may be classified into three categories. Stage one and stage two refers to performing loans and stage three refers to non-performing loans. The stage two loans are the ones that are showing sign of potentially uh, credit pressure and they are uh, classified as such, a sort of watch list uh, for banks. And where are we at the moment in terms of, of stage two loans? Uh, we can see that after also the, the pandemic where banks, many banks have increased and you can see that on the left, uh, hand side, many banks have increased the portion of loans under watch uh, stage two uh, classification. Uh, it's coming down in, in recent time also, meaning that banks have confidence uh, in those pockets, uh, potential pockets of risk. And also on the right, uh, confirming this trend, uh, we can see that the, the coverage by provision of stage two loans is not increasing, meaning that, again, banks are confident that those stage two loans are unlikely to trigger massive problems going forward. So here we are just looking at the, the past, so we, we, we need to be very cautious, but we have those all those signals uh, showing uh, that at the moment, uh, asset quality are, are well under control. This is again uh, a confirmation of the, the trend regarding stage two loans looking at banks. Convergence, uh, the, the breakdown among banks uh, show how homogeneous uh, this is. Uh, of course, you have some uh, banks that are making some effort, but you can see also that since the end of 2021, there is no major surprise. There is no major downside a uh, risk emerging there. Uh, we can see a slight increase here and there, but nothing massive, even for the banks that have the largest um, portion of stage two uh, loans ratio. So this is where, where we are. I'll uh, hand over to you, Keith, and, and come back to this, uh, I think, very interesting evolution uh, across uh, Europe. Excellent. Now, Nicola, thank you very much for that. Some fantastic uh, slides there, and thanks for taking us through them. Um, and so please do type your questions in um, as we uh, come, as we near the end of our session today. But Nicola, um, I've got some questions here. So um, if you don't mind, I'll launch right into them. Um, so you pointed to um, data to, to June 2023. And I was wondering if you can give us a bit of an update. So we're in the midst of Q3 results, um, from what you've seen, have there been any material changes so far? Yes, so yes, we are just in the middle of, uh, of this uh, Q3 uh, earnings season. And most of the, 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 the materials here are based on, on June uh, 2023. So it's really we are monitoring uh, bank after bank what comes out of the, the Q3 results. And I would say there is no big surprise. Uh, there is a continuation of the trend. We cannot deny that banks are uh, facing uh, an increase of the cost of risk. Some uh, display uh, an increase also of their stage three loans, but it's marginal and it's very gradual. Uh, so I would say it's in line with our expectation uh, that asset quality uh, is very likely to continue to deteriorate moderately quarter after quarter. And at the moment, uh, so per se, it's not a positive development, but the way it's controlled and how solid the starting point is, it's not an element that is at that stage uh, putting pressure on uh, the banks we rate. So we are not changing at the moment outlooks we have on banks rating because of asset quality pressure. Okay, excellent, thanks. Um, I guess a similar kind of question, which is uh, given the solid starting point, albeit as you explained very clearly, uh, there's been some deterioration, 
Um, how do you see the future? And perhaps an added nuance to that question um, from where you where you look today, uh, might there be uh, greater challenges in those previously very high NPL countries that you mentioned in your presentation? Yeah. So I think we, we are all looking at that uh, from the, the for quite a long time now, uh, at least uh, uh, since the, the start of the COVID uh, crisis, we, we were expecting asset quality to deteriorate. It did not happen. And now with the rising rates, this is also the, uh, something that we are monitoring very carefully. I think we have no option but to go through scenarios uh, to understand how things could uh, evolve over time. So let's imagine three uh, different scenarios. The, the first one would be about upside. How likely upside is uh, at the moment. Uh, upside, I mean uh, a very uh, stable uh, evolution of asset quality, uh, rosy uh, macroeconomic condition, etc. Uh, that would be the uh, upside. To me, there is very little potential uh, in terms of upside at the moment because we are just in the middle of this fight against inflation and rising rates, it's hurting. Uh, so the uncertainty is about the, how long it's going to last. But at the moment, I see, I see little upside. The baseline is what we observe at the moment. So this inflection point from a very solid starting point and uh, it's it's a bit difficult to say that we are going to see a reversal but that would be the third scenario let's let's think of a reversal of the trend and an acceleration of the trend and how could that evolve i think we need to look back a bit at history and just imagine if a scenario where we would see just a repeat of the past a reversal is is something we could think of. I think at the moment, th there are countries that uh, are, we've seen very rapid improvement. So a bit of volatility that was, that was positive to be able in a short period of time to improve uh, asset quality. It's, it's potentially the countries where we need to have this confirmation that things could not repeat. And it would be really too simplistic to expect that's the chart on the left. We could have a, a, a symmetrical uh, repeat uh, of what we have seen in the past. So it's, it's very difficult to imagine that the vulnerabilities that were the root cause of the problems that we have seen and that were addressed since 2015. And I would say thanks to uh, the, the, the work done at EU level to solve those issues, it's very unlikely that we see a, a repeat. Uh, I think the world has changed uh, since uh, 2015. Monitoring of banks has changed. Uh, we are here only focusing on asset quality, but look at capitalization, uh, improving profitability for banks in the context of rising rates. Those are also very comforting elements to expect Yes, some downside, but a control uh, downside uh, in, in the short term. I mean, in the, the coming, at least the coming two quarters, I think we have good visibility, unless the unexpected, uh, of course. Keith, I think you are on mute. Yep, thank you for that. Uh, there's a question coming from um, uh, one of our viewers, Nicola, um, which refers to something you were talking about around st about stage two loans, uh, which is how do you explain the decreasing or at best stable stage two corporate portfolio in the light of the challenging economic situation? Yeah, and there's a, 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 a slight technical one, which what's the portion of UTP in stage three? I'm not sure if you have that data to hand, but certainly. Can you talk, perhaps talk about, uh, about stage two evolution? Yeah, no, so uh, interesting question. Uh, I won't enter into the details of the, the, the bank's provisioning policies and what you have that is sort of core stage two provision, what is management overlays, and, and sometimes they are aggregated. Uh, in some countries, it's called precautionary provision. Uh, it's unallocated. And in, in other countries, this is a bit more challenge, uh, the fungibility of the, the stage two. 
Um, I think what's what's very interesting with the stage two loans, it, it can refer to two different things. It could be related to a sector that are really entering into more difficult times and banks recognize that and classify uh, entire sectors as stage two loans because things are, are getting a bit more, more complicated for, for the, the, the companies that are operating in those sectors. But you also have uh, banks that are very conservative and classify entire sectors, also portfolios, as stage two because they anticipate that it may become more problematic even if it's not yet the case. So stage two, to, to me, uh, it's quite judgmental, uh, largely judgmental. Um, and, and what we've seen recently is that banks were able to transfer from one root cause to another, uh, the layers that they, they have accumulated over time. So the reason why it's not moving uh, at the moment, uh, stage two loans, I think we are here looking at overlays. We are looking at um, extra provision. It's true that uh, a, a recent evolution that we've noticed in terms of IFRS 9 uh, provisioning policies by banks in recent times, what we observe is that banks are allocating more provisions to stage three loans and less to stage one, stage two. It means that there is less of extra layers. Now we are really provisioning for problem loans per se. So uh, it shows that we are also maybe entering uh, more difficult uh, operating conditions. Okay, actually, Nicola, there's a, there's a, a similar, there's a related question to stage two that, um, again, um, uh, is quite specific, but um, again, it's about state, the, the stage two loan ratio not deteriorating. Uh, but the question is, um, and you may have to get back to our viewer with this one when, if you don't have the data to hand, uh, do you know the transfer ratio from stage two to stage three and the increase in volume? Of that transition, and that's quite specific. Um, yeah. But, uh, so yeah, uh, some some banks provide that also, and and it's more at interim, uh, uh, full year and interim uh, data that we have. We have this. I, I think we have bank by bank the data. Uh, we we haven't aggregated, uh, and it's not you know, just by looking at the migra uh, the evolution of stage two, and stage three loans. Uh, at the moment, what we uh, we see. Banks um, usually, uh, when they comment on the increase of stage three loans, they refer to specific files that were not automatically part of stage two loans uh, until recently, or, or at all even. So you could jump directly from S1 uh, to S3 without being classified as uh, S2 loans. So it's, it's quite difficult to, uh, to monitor. Uh, it's not difficult to monitor because we have bank by bank um, information on the, the, the flows between S1, S2 and, and S3. But I don't think that's the main reason of the increase recently uh, of the, the S3 or what we expect going forward. Because yeah. we are here handling more idiosyncratic or specific files, uh, problem files, than really sector entering into uh, problems. Okay, now, uh, which is a great segue to the next question, Nicola, talking of sectors that are um, experiencing uh, problems. Uh, now, exposure to commercial real estate has been potentially or perhaps the big talking point of 2023. Um, where are we on, on banks' exposure? Yeah. Yeah, indeed, a lo lot of attention on, uh, on commercial real estate, and, and I would say not only on on commercial real estate, but also uh, how property markets are uh, evolving because in terms of uh, mortgage lending also, it would have a big uh, implication for banks. So we are looking at the, the two uh, aspects, um, commercial and, and residential. Just commercial, resident, uh, commercial real estate, it has been a topic for, for quite uh, a while already. Uh, to me, it's a, a non uh, it's a, not a no risk, it's a non. It's very well known that banks are, um, in the context of rising rates, uh, uh, may expect some uh, uh, asset quality issues there. 
when we look at what's happening, uh, I think we have a lot of noise around commercial real estate from uh, foreign markets, markets abroad, in the US, in China. The, they, they made the, 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 the news uh, in, in the recent past uh, because of commercial real estate issues. It's much less the case across Europe. I think it was also a big risk, a big issue during the last financial crisis. And I would say lessons learned, uh, this is under monitoring. Uh, I, I would like to refer to the, the excellent uh, uh, EBA dashboard uh, where we've seen also uh, a specific focus on commercial real estate, on real estate activities and construction uh, with a very interesting monitoring of asset quality there. Um, we have the size of the sector, it's relatively moderate. It's uh, thanks to the uh, diversification of the loan books uh, across Europe, there is a, a degree of dilution uh, within loan books. And asset quality metrics at the moment, out of my mind, I think for uh, real estate activities, it's 1.8%. Uh, and for construction, was it 36 well below 5% for the two sectors. So yes, it's an area where we see pressure. Uh, there is uh, issues in terms of refinancing of commercial real estate in a completely different uh, interest rate environment. It's a pocket of risk like SMEs that are more vulnerable to changing economic conditions. Uh, but at the moment, this is, uh, uh, I would say, a controlled um, situation. Okay, understood. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, there is a question that's come in, which is quite specific, which I'll perhaps uh, ask you to take offline about uh, cost of risk, weight of risk and net results. But I think that one is quite specific, so I, I won't put that to you specifically. But um, to the question, we will, we will come back to you on that one. Um, so uh, broadly speaking, um, you laid out um, a pretty benign picture. Your title uh, uh, yeah, bank, banking at a crossroads or banks at a crossroads um, clearly in, in indicates, um, uh, you know, a, a slightly cautious view. But what do you see as the main risk uh, for European bank asset quality going yeah. forward? Yeah, so I, I think uh, at the moment, uh, if we uh, look at the, the, the wide array of, of risk that have been discussed uh, in the recent past and again, where the, the root cause of what, what we have seen. So commercial real estate is one of them. Uh, we've, we've had the, the, the sector that were heavily exposed to COVID. Uh, are we going to see a, a lag effect, etc., that could materialize and create asset quality problems? At the moment, I, I think uh, all those specific risks are monitored uh, yes, uh, yes, it's a source of risk, but they are known. The, the main risk I see for European banks at the moment, and what we're discussing uh, uh, across Europe with colleagues, is really the impact of rising rates. This is the main risk for borrowers in countries where we have variable rates, rates that have changed very rapidly and that, that have completely changed uh, cash flow patterns for corporates and for households that have to repay uh, their uh, their loans. I think this is really the, the main risk uh, we see uh, going forward uh, in in the coming quarters. The pressure on margin for corporates on disposable income uh, for retail uh, borrowers in the context also of uh, uh, inflation remaining for a while. Uh, this is really what we need to monitor, the most fragile um, populations to the rapidly rising rates. And it's, it's good to see that, as we understand so far, there may be a pause uh, in terms of uh, uh, interest rate uh, moves for, for some time so that uh, banks can digest a bit uh, this, uh, this evolution. Yeah. This is this is also happening at a time where profitability again uh, for banks uh, has improved. So I think it's very important also to see the net net evolution. Rising rates are putting pressure on the most vulnerable borrowers, but the capacity of the banks also to face this situation 
uh, it has improved a lot also uh, in, in recent times. So that's a positive yeah. development also. Absolutely. Um, thank you. So there, there's a question here um, that just come in about um, a piece of research that our structured finance colleagues published uh, early this year about a third of um, um, loans in European CMBS are facing refinancing risk. Um, and so again, uh, unless you have something specific to add, Nicola, what I will uh, do is ask our structured finance colleagues uh, to actually respond specifically to that question because they are tracking CMBS underlyings uh, on a day-to-day on -a -day basis. So uh, unless you have anything specific to add about CMBS refinancing, refinancing risk, I suspect that's a, a, a bit specific at this point. No, no, I think we're on this one. Yeah. Right. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, look, um, um, there are no more questions uh, here, here Nicola. So I suggest we call a halt to our session. Um, so I'd like to thank you very much indeed for fielding questions and for your great presentation. Um, thanks also to our viewers for um, uh, for watching. I hope you found that useful. Um, Nicola's presentation is actually downloadable. Um, today. So if you click on apps at the bottom of the screen and then click on handouts, um, you can see um, the asset quality review uh, presentation is there. Click on that and click download and it will be there with you um, in a few seconds. Um, just a reminder that we will be publishing also um, a research note on asset quality. Um, it's um, clearly very closely related to this with a bit more uh, some specifics on countries, etc. So when that comes out, we will uh, take the liberty of alerting you to that so you can take a read of that. Um, this is clearly uh, an ongoing topic. It's a long running topic. And so to the extent that, um, you know, things, uh, excuse me, do, do deteriorate or, or, or even get better, we will be watching and uh, as appropriate, we'll come back in the future with another webinar presentation. So let me close there. Thanks again. I wish everybody a successful rest of the afternoon and we'll see you next time. So it's goodbye from us. Thank you.